Uh, so welcome everyone to breakout room one session F1. Our topic is suburban, rural and remote care and community. I'm your moderator for this session, Kurt Frillot. I use he, him, his pronouns. I am the CBRC regional manager for Atlantic Canada. I live, work and play in Jibuktuk, also known as Halifax, in Mi'kma'ki, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq. This session will be from 2 to 3 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. At this point in the summit, you likely know how this works. I will give a brief uh, overview of the session and an introduction to our presenters. We'll watch the recordings, and then following all the recorded sessions, we'll have a live Q&A discussion. <clears throat> and discussion. Uh, before we get started, I'll address the standard housekeeping items. First, we have established some community guidelines for the summit to help ensure a safe, respectful and inclusive experience for everyone. This includes respecting personal experiences and ensuring that we are sharing the space with other participants. Please refer to our website, and I believe Doma's going to put the link in the chat on the CBRC website for more information on these guidelines for participation. I should mention we are joined by Domo White, who is going to monitor the chat to ensure those guidelines are upheld. We understand that some of the content and discussions can be difficult to hear and encourage any participant in need to access our counseling support services. So on the cbrcsummit.net site, in the membership directory, uh, you can find a counseling locator listed. The coordinator will be help you connect with the counselor for an informal active listening and support session. We also encourage you to post your questions or comments into the chat box, but we will be holding all the audience questions until after the recorded presentations. Please be aware there is automated, clo automated closed captioning available in both English and French. Uh, today's session is being recorded, as is the entire summit, and it will be published soon by our CBRC amazing communication teams. So we do ask that you refrain from recording today's session yourself. And at the end of the session, you're welcome to share your feedback using our evaluation form, which we'll post in the chat as well. So our first presentation is actually from my home province, where I am right now. Uh, it is Rebuilding Queer Health Space in Rural and Semi-Rural Nova Scotia by David Devine and Cole Titus. Uh, David Devine, or Devine, he'll correct me if I'm wrong, uh, is a registered counseling... It's Devine. Devine. <laughs> David Devine is a registered counseling therapist, candidate, and mental health clinician with Nova Scotia Health in Digby. He moved to Digby uh, just one year ago from uh, Vancouver, where he worked with Vancouver Coastal Health. He holds graduate degrees in clinical psychology, clinical neuropsychology, and addictions medicine. This is his second time presenting at the summit. Cole Titus, he, him, his, is 19 years old and a high school graduate from Annapolis Royal Nova Scotia. He's interested in attending and participating in the summit because he feels like he has stayed behind the curtains and red tape for far too long and wants to make a change in rural communities to help younger, more vulnerable people feel accepted and welcomed in their groups, communities, social events, etc. So let's watch their presentation, which is Rebuilding Queer Health Space in Rural slash Semi-Rural Nova Scotia. Hello, and uh, welcome to the discussion on developing queer safe spaces in rural communities. Uh, I'm here with uh, my guest, and I'll let him introduce himself. Hi, uh, I am Cole Titus, and I am from the area of Annapolis Royal, Nova Scotia. Right. How long have you lived there? I lived here practically my entire life, so for the last 19 years. Okay, great. And thank you, so thank you for joining us. And I know we don't have a lot of time, um, so I'll just go out and ask the question. In um, post-pandemic, what do you see as the need for developing safe queer spaces in rural communities? That is actually a really good question. I think personally, one thing really benefit um, in this sort of situation would be to expand the knowledge and the understanding of what a safe space is to educate the general public, whether they be members of the LGBTQ2S plus community, or they be a straight ally or anyone else in the general public to basically educate them what is a safe space? And once we get that understanding out of the way, we can then say, okay, one example could be we host um, events every now and then for the rural communities in places that would be able to host it. So like an amphitheater, a normal movie theater using the stage perhaps, or in another public area that you're able to convey and project your voice out so everyone in the audience can hear you. Um, 
another thing would be as well is that while in a safe space, uh, give the general audience a reminder that in this space, there's to be little to no uh, expression of hate towards the people who are speaking and to the general people itself. Another would be to um, have the, I would say the budget and the infrastructure available to host events that would allow people in rural communities to come together and be who they want to be. In rural communities, it's very hard, especially because of the pandemic, to get to the places that you need to go to because of many factors, some being transportation, some being the location, times, and in general, it put a big strain on a lot of very, I would say, very secluded and very isolated members of the community. And at the end of the, when the pandemic is over with, um, oh boy, I'm trying to think of some others. Pardon, pardon me, please. Uh, okay. <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a question that I had to ponder a lot on and try to figure out some good examples, right. but it was hard for me to find some, so I had to allocate my resources to friends and ask for some examples from them That's from what great. they have. Um, one example is a friend of mine lives in a rural community in the state of Texas. And where he is, there's not a lot of um, what he calls gay panic there. Everyone's more welcoming. And if anything, they see them as a member of a very tight knit community and basically one big family that you can go to for others. Like, oh, I need a cup of sugar. Yeah, here's your cup of sugar for you. And there's no questions, no, oh, what's he going to do? Is he going to make an advancement on me? Is he going to do this? Or is he going to do that? All the worries are out of the way. Um, in general, I think one answer could be that there needs to be more education and there needs to be more resources allocated to teaching the general public what it means to have a safe space and also understand that in some cases, we are providing safe spaces at the sacrifice and the cost of someone else's safety. Okay. So like as that? an example, um, I can actually, uh, one example could be, we do have places where you can go and express yourself freely, such as like bars and taverns and pubs and nightclubs. And the majority of the people on the inside are members of the LGBTQ community. And some are allies that are in there as well and may not identify with any of the many identities that exist in our community. And some go in there in a sense with a very dark mindset of I'm in here because I wanna see if there's anyone in here I know and then eventually they use that as blackmail for someone, who, as an example, who may be closeted. They're going here, they're trying to remain inconspicuous, undercover, and trying to have a good time. But then you have people coming in going, I know that person. And next thing you know, it's all over Facebook, it's all over social media. And that has just lost every form of safety that they had. And now they, ha they have to find some way of getting back their safety or risk eventually being hunted or attacked and then ending up in a very very horrible situation so it in a sense having these safe spaces you have them but it comes at the cost and sacrifice of someone else's safety okay well that's that's a good thing to keep in mind <clears throat> what would you say for um well you're 19 so um yes. The younger generation. We only have uh, about two minutes left, but what do you think queer youth need in two minutes? Uh, would you be able to repeat the question? Um, I was. Uh, what do you think queer youth need in rural communities? Oh boy. Hmm. I find that 
in our generation around my age everyone is more accepting and more or less like you could like subtly tell in some ways if someone is or isn't a member mm-hmm. whereas with much with the much older generations like people who are in the baby boomer generation or the gen x or in my case my grandmother being a member of the silent generation her being like 84 85 mm-hmm. she, it's a very large and diverse uh group of people that you gotta like explain who everyone is and what it is but whereas with like gen z and millennials everyone's like oh oh you're this and then they yeah, share no a similar <laughs> Yeah. They share a very similar um, explanation, and it's like, okay, yeah, and then you just go on from there. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, I guess you know, moving forward, what you mentioned, you know, you've mentioned queer safe spaces, that sort of thing. Um, how would you? How do you think we could begin getting that off the ground? Um, one example could be that we have say as an example we have one annual fundraiser where we have the in a sense um we have the members of the community who are on like a higher um fame status i guess i don't know the term for that but their publicity if they're really high we could have these numbers say hey once a year we're going to host a charity event and we raise money and then this money that we eventually raised on this day, we donate it to a cause that deserves it. So uh, we just, we donate our money to say the IWK health center in Halifax, or we donate it to the Trevor project, or we donate it to some other uh, charitable organization that can allocate those funds to putting it into rural communities and saying, okay, you have this amount of money to hold your own social event at this place and rent it out for a day or, um, in a sense, build a like a like a club or a bar or a tavern that's accepting and welcoming to others. And on some nights, they're like, "Okay, we got this night. You can come over and have drinks on discount because we're trying right. to show that we are accepting and we enjoy the company of everyone around us." That sounds great. Well, we've gone a little over, but that's all right. Um, thank you very much, Paul. Yeah. I really appreciate your time. Yeah. Thank you, my fellow Nova Scotians. Uh, just a reminder, of course, for our participants, if you have questions, please type them out in the chat. Our presenters then have a little more time to prepare a response, or they can even possibly direct answer you directly in the chat. Um, all right. So from one coast to the other, our next presenters come from the far side of Turtle Island from where I am. Uh, Selena and John are presenting on Barriers in a Tourist Town, Being Queer in Tofino. Uh, Selena Rogalski, they, she, and John Sweeney, he, him, are the co-founders of uh, Coastal Queer Alliance, a recently formed grassroots organization based out of Tofino, uh, hence the title, uh, British Columbia. The lack of re- representation, resources, and a sense of community between queer individuals they experienced living in Tofino was the catalyst in creating Coastal Queers as an effort to reduce barriers for queer people living in their community. Today, they'll be speaking on what these barriers are, what efforts have been put forth to address them, and where they hope to go from here. So let's watch their presentation now. Hello everyone, and thank you for being here today. My name is Selena Rogalski, and I use they and she pronouns. My name is John Sweeney, and I use he, him pronouns. We're the co-founders of Coastal Queer Alliance, a nonprofit that has grown as a grassroots response to the lack of formalized supports, resources, education, and representation for the queer community on the west coast of Vancouver Island. The initiative to create Coastal Queers arose from both a personal and community-oriented desire to create a stronger presence for 2SLGBTQIA plus individuals in our town. Engaging with businesses and members of the community involved in healthcare, tourism, and recreation has shaped the ways that our goals thus far have been oriented. We want to extend a big thank you to Surf Sister, Epic Pharmacy, Tough City Skate, Gaia Grocery, and Yuki Lady Skate for being some of the first organizations to tangibly engage with Coastal Queers. A large thank you as well goes out to the Clyde Biosphere Trust for providing initial funding through grant applications and to Andrea McQuaid, our third director of Coastal Queers for her continuous support from behind the scenes. We are so grateful to have the opportunity to present today some of the challenges and barriers experienced by queer individuals living in Tofino, BC, a tourist town with a high percentage of seasonal community members. 
Tofino is located on the traditional and unceded territory of the Tlaoquiat First Nation. As we enter discussions today, we're informed by the understanding that queer history and Indigenous history in Canada can't be separated, as acknowledging the harm that colonialism has created with Indigenous communities is fundamental to understanding the ways in which colonialism has also informed our current perspective of queer identities. Although queer people have always existed outside of the binary, both pre- and post-colonialism, our language surrounding queer identities today is rooted firmly within a colonial understanding of gender and sexuality. When we conflate ideas and language surrounding gender, sexuality, roles, bodies, norms, and expression, we do ourselves a massive disservice, not only by continuing to exist in binaries that have never been rooted in truth, but also by undervaluing each of those facets as expansive, fluid, and distinct parts of ourselves. The combination of colonialism and Christianity has had destructive impacts on our society at large, with marginalized communities bearing the brunt of those repercussions. As settlers on unceded Tilokwiat land, we're conscious that our learning surrounding reconciliation will be an unending and continuous process, and we're grateful for the opportunity to learn from those who are willing to share. Listening to and amplifying local First Nations teachings is fundamental in ensuring that our actions within our organization align with our beliefs surrounding the intersectionality of all oppression. The information presented today will be primarily anecdotal, with statistics gathered from the 2019 InterVistas report on the economic impact of tourism in Tofino. Around 2,500 people live year-round in Tofino, a number that can double or triple during the high season from May through September. Essential services such as the hospital and pharmacies service residents of Tofino, the surrounding First Nations communities of Tayastanis, Heshkwit, Esoista, Hot Springs, Hauzit, and Apitsit, as well as the neighboring town of Yuklulit, Itatsu, Makoa, and the Yuklulit First Nation. During the high season, the ratio of tourists to citizens is approximately 300 to 1, averaging around 600,000 tourists annually and generating an average of $57 million per year in tourist revenue. The town is a popular destination for celebrities, Canadian tourists, and international travelers alike. With the support of tourism and municipal resources, Tofino has done a remarkable job of marketing itself to a diversity of identities and has been successful in creating off-season markets as well as new markets entirely. With an easily supportable population base, an enthusiastic and diverse community, and, consi and consistent requests for support, that the same resourcing has not been directed to support for the queer community can feel intentional, a feeling that contributes to the lack of representation for visitors and residents alike. Queer identities are not reflected in advertising or resourcing priorities, and this can lead to a myopic visioning problem, resulting in the belief that there is no queer community, so the queer community needs no support. Obviously, this is not the case when you look to the actual community members. The diversity of challenges encountered in creating sustainable queer initiatives, such as the affordable housing crisis that Tofino faces, an understaffed and overworked healthcare system, and simply that no formalized initiative for the queer community has had a long-term impact, all compound to provide a considerable barrier. For queer people coming to live here, the lack of obvious visible community can be a large deterrent to staying. We come to the first barrier of being queer in Tofino, a complete lack of formalized representation. There are no queer community groups, no ways to meet other queer people outside of online dating apps, no structural or symbolic recognition of the queer community through things like rainbow sidewalks, flags, or other visual cues, and no queer specific events, including pride. While identities and community groups like artists, environmentalists, and surfers are held up as archetypal, and where corresponding celebrations are funded appropriately from the municipal budget, there is little acknowledgement in policy or outreach that the queer community needs support. The prevailing demonstrated attitude demands that community groups organize around cause and causes and identities and then seek support without recognition that offering support first is most often necessary when organizing around queer identities. As our organization continues to exist in such a grassroots nature, a large barrier for the Alliance is securing funding for compensation. As mentioned, queer initiatives in the past have often been single events. Without adequate funding to build consistency and trust in a small community, organizations often collapse or don't get off the ground. The second barrier, and one with more potential for dire consequences, is the lack of resources. As mentioned previously, the healthcare sector of Tofino services not only the town itself, but also up to 10 other communities. While it's unsurprising that wait times to see doctors and have lab work are long, even at the point in which a queer patient does see a doctor, there's a lack of practitioner knowledge surrounding queer-specific healthcare. Doctors are unfamiliar with prescribing PrEP and PEP, there are no resources available to those living with HIV and AIDS, there are no rapid STI testing centers, and there are no doctors specialized in gender-affirming care. 
Additional services like mental health support are overtaxed and under-supported, with little in support directed for the queer community. While we recognize that all community members are impacted by the wildly discordant correlation of capacity and demand in healthcare services, we also realize that the impact for, on queer community members confronting any of the above complications is amplified. The position we are in as founders of what we hope to continue as a long-term initiative for the queer community of Tofino is extremely unique. Any larger city centre in Canada likely already has an established queer community, and smaller centres could potentially face challenges of conservatism and queer phobia in creating a queer initiative. In this space, we have the opportunity to create an organisation that is the first of its kind here, one that is wanted, needed, and outwardly championed by the community. We imagine the future of queerness in Tofino as it relates to resourcing, representation, and collaboration as being one that provides support for all, as well as an awareness of the false societal binary surrounding gender, sexuality, and life as a whole. This is not a responsibility that we take lightly. Our goals up until this point have been primarily representation-led, as meaningful change for the queer community will only be able to occur if there is a sense of community for 2S LGBTQIA people living in Tofino. Through events like Queer Surf, Queer Skate, and Queer Community Zoom calls, we have been able to facilitate connections between individuals and begin to create a larger sense of queer community in Tofino. Creating proper resources presents more challenges, as changing policy, infrastructure, and reducing barriers in systems such as healthcare is a large task to tackle for an organization at our size. However, knowing that the overall social climate in Tofino is one that supports diversity and representation, we are hopeful that our next steps of implementing business workshops, generating seed funding, and continuing to listen to the queer community in our, in our town will be supported. Thank you for being present and listening to our experiences today. We welcome any questions and value feedback from those who may have experiences in similar situations of how to progress grassroots initiatives into a more long-term and established organization. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Selena and John, for first off, beautiful BC background. Like you definitely milked the, you know, we're in beautiful BC. All right, uh, so our final presenter today- I got homesick. <laughs> Our final presenter today is uh, Skylar Sutherland Lutet uh, with Two Spirit Revitalization. Uh, Skylar is First Nation Cree. His li lineage is from Atapawaskat, holding a diploma in social services with Indigenous specialization. He has worked in areas of harm reduction to SLGBTQQIA youth and families and counseling in Batuana, First Nation. Currently, he is doing his bachelor's in political science. So let's see Skylar's recorded presentation. Hello, everybody. Thank you for being here today. I honor everybody's spirit for being here. I'll be doing my short presentation on two-spirit revitalization. I'll introduce myself in the language first as well. Hello, my name is Skylar. My spirit name is Nabe Mishkiki Nene, which translates to water medicine man. I go by he, him, they, them pronouns. Um, I am Bear Clan, and my family is from Otto Piscat, James Bay, Hudson Bay area. I'm going to start off with sharing a bit about my story. I grew up in the child welfare system, foster care, which is another form of a colonial assimilation system that was created to really take Indigenous children away from their families as part of colonial assimilation. So growing up in foster care, uh, I definitely felt loss of identity, loss of culture, loss of knowledge of who I was. I had no clue I was even really Indigenous, really fully understanding what that meant. And it was really difficult to feel like I had the validity of being Indigenous or First Nation in my case, because I didn't grow up with any sense of culture. That made it very difficult, very challenging. Growing up, that's kind of the experience I went through was just this unknowingness, this um, unfamiliarity, this um, hidden information almost in a way where I couldn't access knowledge the way that I had hoped because there was that disconnect, that dissonance of who I was as a First Nation person in contrast to the colonial system that I was forced to abide by without the consent, of course, because I was so young. As I grew up, I kind of just felt different. I felt like I didn't fit in with the different gender roles. I, you know, I tried figuring out who I was and it just felt like nothing really fit. And then I, you know, came across Two-Spirit Identity, you know, one time when I was younger, I was walking and somebody came up to me and she had said to me that I was Two-Spirit and I had no idea what she meant back then. I was so young. And again, I had no connection to the culture. 
So that obviously made it sort of difficult as well. When I was about 19 years old, things started to get really bad in my life. Things were already pretty bad, but things got worse. Uh, I started to feel like I didn't know who I was and I didn't feel like I had a purpose really on this earth anymore. I came to that point of having suicidal ideation, all these very difficult depression things that kind of went ongoing in my life. At 19 years old was a pivotal point where I was trying to decide if I uh, had really wanted to stay or if I really wanted to go. And so it was really challenging to face that at such a young age. All through that, I had coped in ways that were not the healthiest for me, but I coped to survive as a means of survival. And that's something that a lot of folks do experience. And when I did come out, eventually I realized it's because I'm two spirit and I did come out and I was not accepted. Some people, they are accepted and that's phenomenal. And that's what I'd hope for everybody. And then in some cases, such as myself, I was not accepted. I was given the ultimatum to either stay at home and live as female, ascribe gender, that was by society, by my adoptive family, by peers, by Western gender binary even. And the ascription of that was very difficult for me to uphold. Therefore, I chose to, to leave, leaving behind everything and was very much alone through that. Ended up in forms of poverty and forms of homelessness and struggling really is what it came down to. And throughout college, I actually worked in the field of social services. I worked with Two-Spirit, LGBTQQAI youth, adult families. And working with Two-Spirit youth was one of my favorite things that I've ever done. So now that I've shared a little bit about my story, I'm going to talk about Two-Spirit revitalization. What does it mean to revitalize? Revitalization is bringing awareness to what is not easy to acknowledge. The things that are painful, the things that are uncomfortable the things that make us acknowledge our privileges and the privileges that people do not have as well. And when I think in the context of Two-Spirit folks, I think about the history, the suicide rates, the lack of support, lack of healthcare, uh, you know, barriers, the hoops that we have to jump through, the exhaustion that we face being our own advocates, not being able to hear teachings about yourself, being reflected in ceremony spaces. These are all things that are not easy for us to acknowledge, not easy for us to have awareness about. That's part of revitalization within itself. A regaining a sense of identity. What does that mean? Identity means so many different things. You know, we're not one dimensional people. You know, a lot of us were intersectional. Our intersectionality makes up the whole pieces of who we are, not just one, but all of them together orchestrate and intertwine. And that's why I put in here internal, the eye on identity, internal, the internal identity. Or for some folks, it could be the gender identity that they feel internally, the spirit that they feel internally. The external, how we express ourselves externally to the outside world, to our peers, to our communities, you know, even in ceremony. And then culturally, we're gaining a sense of identity culturally. How do we find where we belong in our culture when nobody's talking about us? How do we find and regain a sense of identity culturally when our culture isn't really saying there's space for you here? In some places there are, and there's two-spirit you know, programming, two-spirit events, two-spirit powwows, but in some communities that's not the case. Working together, so not putting all the responsibility on two-spirit people, this is huge. You know, I cannot explain how exhausted I am <laughs> a lot of the times because I'm constantly informing everybody on where's the two people and putting my hand up and sharing and trying to get us to go there in those uncomfortable places in a kind, loving, respectful, gentle way, but it's a necessary vital thing. When we're working on revitalizing these pieces and where does two spirit people fit in that as well, how are we going to acknowledge the fact that we should also be doing the work, not relying on two spirit people to do all of the responsibility of it. Getting comfortable with the uncomfortable. It sounds contradictory, it sounds weird, but I'll explain it right now. So what is comfortability? Comfortability keeps us comfortable. It keeps us secure. We all like comfortability. It's relaxing, you don't have to think too much, you don't have to feel too much, you just feel relaxed, chilled out. It's comfortable. It provides us with a sense of knowing rather than a sense of unknowing. And it is a privilege. So if I am listening to an elder share teachings, which I often am because I like to listen to elders. And I hear men and women being talked about for the two hour like talk or sharing circle. And you know, men and women were the only people that were talked about during that space. Who has the privilege in that space? That's something we got to think about. It's a privilege to hear teachings reflect you 
whenever you go access cultural resources, um, those are all forms of privilege that not all of us really think, oh, that might be a privilege I have. And to honor and acknowledge that, what can we do to be aware of spaces like that to ensure that Two-Spirit people are also being included? Uh, the reason I put the picture of water here is because water is life. It provides an ability to move through obstacles, barriers, challenges, and it provides us with transformation. We can use water as a medicine to help us understand that uncomfortability doesn't have to be forever. Uncomfortability might be a moment in time. Uncomfortability might be, you know, hearing a conversation and being part of that conversation where we say, hey, I haven't heard anything about Two-Spirit people, you know, and they're very vital. I care for them. Can we also include them in this conversation? We're always told, and I've heard it time and time again, that the youth are a future generation. The youth are the future leaders. We can't forget about the youth. We got to make sure the youth don't get left behind. We got to make sure the youth learn the teachings so they can carry on those teachings to the future generations after them even, which is important. That means when youth share, we listen. That means when youth might challenge something with kindness that maybe needs to be looked at, that we honor that, that we don't take it as an attack or personal. We, we, we understand that it's coming from maybe lived experience. Maybe it's coming from a place of ancestor knowledge that needs to be brought back again and revitalized. Hiding knowledge from many lifetimes, that's what the youth does. Speak with the ancestors' voices, carry teachings that we've forgotten. How do they do this? I'll explain right now. We all have gifts. I believe we're all gifted in our own unique ways. I'm going to talk about my gifts as a two-spirit person specifically because that's kind of what I'm catered to in this presentation. So for myself, I get a lot of visions. I'm brought to a lot of places through vision, through dreams. Um, I'm very connected to spirit. Um, I often like to say I'm always walking between spirit world just as equally as I'm walking between physical world. Through these visions, I'm given knowledge, teachings, information that I'm to my responsibility is to bring that back to communities, bring it back forward into spaces like we're having today to speak my truth. And it's not necessarily my truth. It's a truth of knowledge and information that was given to me through spirit, through vision. But it is a truth that I've lived as a lived experience person. Even though I'm a youth and I may have not lived the full cycle of the four directions, as we might call it, the different stages of life, it doesn't necessarily mean that the knowledge is less valid or that the knowledge isn't inclusive to all ages of life, inclusive to the full circle of that medicine wheel in the four directions. And it's important that when you speak up and they bring those teachings forward, that we listen, not just with our ears, with our heart, not just with our heart and our ears, but with our spirit. Those of you who are, who are like me, who are passionate people, who are two spirit, who are youth, and you have knowledge that you want to share, but you're too afraid to because you don't want to come across as rude or you don't want to speak over an elder. You don't want to come across as disrespectful to elders, which is completely understandable because I certainly do not. You can challenge with kindness. Challenging isn't about negative connotation. We often want to put a negative connotation there. Challenging could be a positive thing too. It doesn't always have to be negative, but you can speak up and say and advocate and share knowledge and share teachings with kindness and the need for those changes in the community, cultural spaces and teachings. So it's really important that when youth have that courage to share or they're advocating for change that needs to happen because they're noticing that things are happening that's causing harm to the youth, then it is okay to do it as long as it's done with kindness, compassion, respect, honor, courage, but that it's important we don't completely dismiss it ignore it and shut it down completely because that's just going to make youth internalize it within themselves and not use their voice. And that to me makes, makes you feel very sad. I don't want youth to feel that they cannot use their voices. Change requires awareness, requires acknowledgement, requires accountability and responsibility. The awareness of what needs to change for two spirit people in community, in ceremony spaces, in culture, and identity in those spaces, which leads to acknowledgement. That awareness, that flicker of a thought, that moment of a thought of awareness leads to the, oh, I acknowledge that this is something that needs to change. And then that acknowledgement goes into how am I held accountable for this? And that leads into what is my responsibility with that accountability hand in hand.
that change can happen internally within our own spirit, within our own selves. Perhaps maybe you have recognized that you've been giving teachings on a very strict gender binary and realized that you're leaving out two spirit people. And that's something that you want to work on. And that awareness has come forward to you. That acknowledgement has come forward to you. And now you're saying, I acknowledge that that might have put harm onto people that might have hurt other two spirit people in spaces. And I'm learning from that. And with that, I take responsibility. I'm being accountable to those things and how I'm going to move forward in a different way. The change could be external, a community coming together collectively and, and celebrating two spirit people, a community putting the work and effort of ensuring that two spirit programming and services is happening. Those are all collective community changes. Change requires being uncomfortable in the unknown and ability to work through it. Things you don't know. If you don't know much about two-spirit people, you might be uncomfortable with it because it's new to you or it's not something you're used to. I really want you to understand that it's okay to sit with that and to figure out, hmm, again, what is the awareness around that? What do you acknowledge within that thinking? What is your accountability and then your responsibility moving forward? To really open your eyes and spirit and heart to these things. It requires getting informed on what is the history of two-spirit people? What happens to our two-spirit youth who have high suicide rates, but nobody's talking about it because we rather stick with the gender binary because that's more comfortable for us? What happens when we say it's too uncomfortable for us, it's too unknown for us, so we rather just pretend it never happened, that two people don't exist instead? Who is that harming? And what is our responsibility to changing so that we can have a better space and better support, better empowerment to two-spirit people. And change is small. It doesn't have to be overnight, right? Like I'm just to make that clear, I'm not saying change happens overnight, but it does happen and it can happen. Thank you so much for listening to this presentation. Uh, leave you with the message that is be the change you wish to see. We all have the capacity to be the change. It's never too late to be the change. And thank you, Skylar, and actually thank you all of our presenters. So it is now time for our classic Q&A session. Uh, I haven't seen any pop up in the chat, but don't worry. I Oh, you can't see it. Oh, there's a notebook here. You can't see it, but I've been taking notes. Uh, I am going to start with one question for all of our panelists, and we'll go in reverse order. So Skylar, this is being teed up for you. Uh, you know, obviously, as someone who grew up in a somewhat rural area myself, I can appreciate a lot of what you're saying, um, you know, it feels really weird to feel isolated in an isolated place, right? To feel like, you know, if anyone ever watched the British sketch go, uh, Little Britain, there was the only gay in the village. And sometimes it does feel that way and it can be very isolating. So how do we connect? How do we find our people in rural areas or even just like when you, even in your own community, you just feel a little bit more isolated. So we're gonna start with Skylar and then move to the coastal queers and then back to Nova Scotia. Thank you. So I guess, one way is kind of what Coastal Queers kind of mentioned is starting up different nonprofits, starting up different services and programs or groups that you'd like to provide support to individuals within the rural community to kind of bring them together as a means of reaching out in a form of outreach in a way. Um, but it, it gets complicated with Indigenous context. So I feel like that is a whole other thing in itself in the sense that you're not just facing like different sexuality diversity and gender diversity being two different things, um, but you're also facing the indigeneity that is within your own experience, within your own intersectionality. And because of colonialism being such a strong impact that has really affected the communities largely today in regards to how we, we see gender and the strict binary being reflected within teachings, within communities, within culture, because of that colonization. Uh, and it starts from as, as early as residential schools and the very strict segregation and divide by the sexes. That's where it kind of like really started to take root in its deeply ingrained ways. Um, so I think for Indigenous communities, I think how to bring people together is to remember not to leave people out. <laughs> and it's, it sounds so simple, but it, unfortunately, it's like something that I find is really needs to be worked on. You know, when I say that with kindness and with love, because I care for the well-being of all people in the community, not just one, you know, I care about all the well-being of the community. Um, and I think it's important to start creating uh, ceremonial spaces that say that you have a place in the ceremony because Two-Spirit have had places in ceremonies and communities. They were actually held in high sacred regard prior to colonialism, right? And the forced assimilation and genocide. 
So we really need to start striving towards how do we ensure that everyone is feeling reflected and invited in and empowered to come and step into a place where they, they have access to healing. Um, because in Indigenous context, we think of the medicine wheel as a physical, emotional, spiritual, mental. We think of the whole realm within its health and what that means to a spirit and a physical embodiment. So I really just want to see more of that change kind of going on in that context for Indigenous people who might be queer or gender diverse and sexuality diverse, whatever the case may be, is more of us unpacking that and going to the uncomfortable places. Because until, it's, until we go there, and we actually do the work, it's not going to necessarily change, right? So that's kind of the thing that I have to share about that. Yeah. Thank you so much for the question. All right. Thanks, Karen. All right. I'm bouncing over to beautiful Tafina, where it's much earlier in the day than it is here in Nova Scotia. Yeah, uh, I can maybe speak to it first. Um, I think just in terms of like moving to a town where um, I previously lived in a city where there was a really diverse and abundant queer community and coming to Tofino and just kind of having no outward like ability to find anyone that was queer outside of like a dating app which I think also puts um pressure and uh like maybe not the type of relationship that you would want like I think that it was really just kind of like mind-boggling to not know like anyone if anyone was queer like I'm in the grocery store I'm like what and you me I don't know you know so I think um I would say the first thing to do is honestly just like it, we we did it in such a grassroots way we put up some posters around town we said if you're interested in learning more about like a little bit of a history of what pride how pride originated a little bit of like history on queer identities in general like come to the zoom meeting and we got like 30 people there and from there like just people like it showed that there was an interest it kind of connected us and we also wanted to do our research and make sure that nothing around us was happening that we weren't aware of like we don't want to reinvent the wheel and we also don't uh, want to take over spaces that aren't ours so I think that it's been a huge um, process of just like understanding where people are at how we can collaborate with those who have already started like thinking about this maybe in other ways or similar ways that have values with us in our community and just trying to further all um, kind of means of inclusion and uh, safety in our community for everyone. Mm -hmm. And also I think like apart from it being like always an educational experience or something like that with trying to get people together, um, it's just been really fun and we've been fortunate to just because of uh, having that opportunity to kind of just put it out there, get people together, ask what sort of activities people might be interested in, what ideas uh, we could throw out there, and just kind of trying to find common interests and things like that uh, within the community. Um, and basically, yeah, just like hosting events where we can kind of just like put a day and a time and activity um, and have people come together. And when you all come together, you're not necessarily talking about being queer or you're maybe, maybe you are, but you know, the whole point is just to kind of like show up and know that everybody kind of understands you and you can all just like be uh, joyful together and have fun and everything and make those connections. Um, and then that'll help kind of just like foster more growth. And it kind of takes, takes the weight off of um you know one person's shoulders from just like wanting to from thinking that they have to do everything because they don't see it to uh just finding like a fun atmosphere to meet a lot of people and then realize that lots of other people are working towards sim similar goals and would like to see things happen uh you know on a on a grander scale um but yeah it's been it's been great Thanks. I also appreciate uh, the point about that, you know, like, make sure you're not duplicating efforts because so many things are just, you know, it's just by word of mouth, right? You know, you like, oh, there's a queer coffee club that like meets once a month. I didn't know because it's not posted anywhere. It's just sort of like this group of friends are new and it's expanded. Uh, I can really appreciate that because, you know, if I had like an unlimited budget, one of the things I would do for my own community would be to create a queer welcome wagon. So like I've moved to the city, like, great. I'm gonna come over, I'm gonna tell you everything you need to know about this city, and like I'm gonna give you like gift coupons, to like the local queer cafes, that sort of thing. Wouldn't that be great? All right, so uh, bouncing back to my beautiful uh, Nova Scotia. Uh, so the question was basically, like, how do we connect? How do we find ourselves and our people in rural areas? And then after this, we do have a question from one of our uh, pa uh, participants that I'll share with all of you. So David Cole, you can thumb wrestle to go who's first. 
Well, uh, David, I'll let you go first. So that way um, okay. I can kind of collect my thoughts just a little bit more. Okay, all right. Um, but also you got, you got all the screen time earlier. So, um, <laughs> you know, I think I, this is a very interesting question because I'm struggling with it personally. Um, having lived in cities all my life, I am, I am a total city boy. And I'm used to be able to, you know, fire up, you know, meet up or uh, maybe a dating app or just find where the, you know, where, where my people are. Um, and also for me, it's, it's, there's an added component in that I live pretty much in the town that I work as a healthcare provider. So I'm constantly doing that dance, you know, and I'm, uh, one thing I didn't mention in my intro is I'm also WPATH certified. So I'm seeing people who are trans, seeing people who are maybe still in the closet um, or some people who are not in the closet, but you know, they, they're being very careful. And so it's a delicate dance. It's like, well, gosh, it'd be really nice if we could hang out, but I'm your therapist. <laughs> Can't do that. <laughs> um, and trying to, in fact, I, I wrote down uh, the idea of an LGBT queer Zoom group. I think that would be great. But again, it's that, for me, that delicate dance. Um, I think in terms of what I've discovered in the past year of how to meet people is just being open and honest. Like I've got, you know, in my office at the hospital, I've got this big, you know, pride flag. And over the summer, I flew a pride flag out here. Um, I've been very pleased to see that it's actually a pretty welcoming community. Um, I happen to live next door to a lovely gay couple in their late 50s, early 60s. Um, so kind of, I think, being open without being necessarily threatening, um, if that makes any sense. Uh, but I think that in terms of, and I think Cole touched on it in his piece, is that trying to stretch, figure out ways to use technology, how to use word of mouth, how to use, um, how to be visibly queer without jeopardizing your safety or the safety of others uh, is the big question. And, you know, I happen to meet Cole because we are in an affinity group um, that I happened to stumble on the, the Telegram chat. So that's how I know Cole. Um, so I think, you know, try not to let being out in the middle of nowhere, as I affectionately call this place, um, the, you know, being a barrier. Um, and I try not to run to Halifax all the time for my LGBT community. Um, I think, you know, just sort of being open and not afraid. Be careful, but be open and don't be afraid, and, and try not to be afraid. I don't know if that really answered your question, but that was off the top of my head. It was from the heart, and that's what matters. Okay, cool. <laughs> um, I was gonna say for me, I'm gonna I wholeheartedly agree with what Skylar and Coastal Queers and what David has said as well. Like being in rural Nova Scotia and in any rural part of Canada, with how large it is and the diaspora of the community of like 38 million people, it's really hard to kind of connect and actually socialize like how humans are we are social creatures we want to talk and we want to interact with others in order to feel engaged and in order to feel understood and being in rural communities it's hard to do that because especially because of the pandemic you have to rely on social media like telegram or snapchat or facebook or so on and so forth to even get a hold of someone and then and in another sense as well, going all the way up to Halifax for events and then coming back, it's like a two, three hour drive for some people. For some, maybe it's even five or seven. And it takes a lot of resources, it takes a lot of time that even in some cases, it's hard to manage that without ending up in a sort of situation where you're like, oh, I'd love to do it, but I can't because, um, well, I don't have the gas or it's too far away or it's too late. And I find that we need more infrastructure and we need more recognition and more uh, informational awareness around rural communities such as like Bridgetown or Yarmouth and et cetera. 
and say like, hey, once a month or once a week, we're going to have this small little get together in a internet or we're going to have it over Zoom or we'll have it in a Telegram group just so that way we can all connect and understand one another and make friends and be able to say, yeah, I can make friends on here instead of having to rely on dating apps in order to talk with someone or rely on the old fashioned version of, yeah, let's meet up in a bar and or a cafe. Let's talk there. All right, thank you so much. Okay, so our first question from the audience is, uh, are different ways of engaging the public uh, in rural communities needed? I live in a village of a thousand people and it is difficult to find things that people, excuse me, bring people together affordably and in a context that makes sense in a much more isolated setting. Often things come across as big city issues and get dismissed rather than discussed, which definitely makes me think of the stuff uh, our coastal queers were talking about, right? The fact that there's just none of these things. I mean, you are literally isolated. You're on an island, basically. <laughs> um, so the question is uh, how, I'm sorry, I lost my track of the question there. Are different ways of engaging uh, the public and rural community in rural communities needed and if so, i'm going to expand that and if so what are they how do you engage with rural, the public and that's open to anyone who wants to answer <laughs> maybe we can speak on that first um we honestly found that the best way to find out like as we said in our presentation the way that our goals of our or of our organization have been formed this far of like really just been asking people what they want to see right like I think that for lots of people, Tofino is where is one of the only places you can surf in Canada, but there's not a lot of queer surf representation whatsoever. And so queer people face barriers in, um, and it's not a, it's not an accessible sport by any means. You need the gear you, and it's cold water surfing. And so I think, um, like we partnered up with a local business who had already had the initiative a long time ago to create um, space for women in the water. And then we expanded. So now monthly we have a queer surf and the business provides all of the rentals and lessons for free people just sign up they come and it's a super easy way for you to like ask your community what they want and then see what makes sense there so in terms of your village with a thousand people that you know oh it's too big city or these issues don't matter here i would suggest is there a way that you can try to get together even just a platform um, or a brainstorming session of like what do we want to see here what does make sense for our community what are the activities that the people in our town want to happen and then from there how, what are the tangible steps we need to take in order to create the initiatives that we want to see in the, in the place that we want to live and as well as that we when we uh did kind of put, out, put the invite out just for like anybody to want to come together and talk about you know what what things could look like, you know, go over a bit of history and stuff. A lot of the people who showed up were um, community leaders, and that could be um, people who uh, were in, you know, like town leadership positions, First Nations leaders, uh, business owners is a huge one, because I think um, if we can kind of show people that in their business, um, understanding the queer community better adds a lot more valuable to uh, or it's a valuable um, part of their business and it'll just create uh, a safer environment for their staff and their customers um, you know a, a business person is taking care of or, or uh, has a reach to a lot of people and that way um, if we can engage those community leaders um, then they'll be also hopefully we can we can direct that knowledge into their staff to their customers and everything like that rather than just trying to put that information out into the open um just to the public it's kind of easier to try and channel it through specific people and missions that already exist uh by other leaders in the community and just try and kind of yeah find that that common ground and then expand in those areas instead of just trying to like put it out there all from the beginning you know work smarter not harder <laughs> <laughs> great all right so i am going to uh, move to our last question in the q a although uh there is a question from my colleague yohei in the chat if anyone wants to address that uh this one is going to start again with close clears but then i'm going to expand it to our other panelists and then that'll be like our last question of the day because we only have six minutes left before the end of the summit 
so this question is from my colleague Anurata. Uh, thank you all. I was really struck by Selena and John's comments about gaps, barriers, and about imagining a future. Uh, outside of uh, Anurata's work with CBRC, uh, she does some grassroots work with QT BIPOC folks in a large suburb. Over a million people live there, so slightly different scale than what we've been talking about. Uh, that still doesn't have the kinds of services, physical space, and more that you've described. Uh, but for our QT BIPOC communities, people have said that they don't want us to transition to be yet another nonprofit, since the nonprofit structure itself doesn't align with the kind of future that we want to be building. Have there been any conversations among Coastal Queer Alliance folks about models other than the nonprofit one? And uh, the, I thought that actually this was, you sort of queued it up very well, so because you were talking about like how we want, like I, I try to write it down, but it's hard to like pay attention and write things down. But you said like, how do we want to, what do we want to see, right? So is it necessarily, you know, going to be a nonprofit structure or is it sort of like a little more loosey-goosey? And for our other panelists, basically, you know, uh, we'll start again, we'll start in Tofino and then move outward. Uh, you know, does it have to be a formal structure or, you know, are you going to create something new? So we'll start. Yeah, great question. Thank you. Um, it's so loosey-goosey. Like the reason why we structured ourselves as a nonprofit was essentially to be able to um, get validation for governmental funding. So it, it was really coming from a place of like, how can we secure funding in a way where we're not registered as a charity, but we're still able to set up like a business account for a an organization that would have like, it's all about money, essentially the nonprofit status. Um, what we really have found like is that it's so, it's, it's pretty much three of us that run the organization. Like there's there's not, um, there's not a structure in the typical sense that a nonprofit would, uh, would run. And so I think looking down the road at like the type of future that we would like to create for coastal queers, we would hopefully be able to even get outside of like the um, economic and uh, kind of municipal colonial bar like barriers that exist um, because it's not really within an organization, our organization's beliefs and values to like try to um, continue to exist in a system that we don't believe in. But unfortunately for now, like um, funding is just the largest issue that we face. And so getting the nonprofit status was a way that we were able to apply for grants that were beyond the scope of a municipal budget. Thank you. Yes, we're here in this sense that we're trying to tear down, not always easy. Uh, anyone else want to add something to that? Um. I really haven't given it much thought. I think that, especially with where we are, um, it's more important to have just like, I wanna say affinity groups or people that have shared interests, similar interests, just to get together. It doesn't need to be for a formalized structure. Maybe somewhere down the line, uh, it could be. I know that, uh, and Cole might be able to talk about this better since I didn't attend, but there was a, um, I think Annapolis, where Cole lives, had its first Pride um, weekend. And I think that went well. <clears throat> so having things that are structured like, you know, a Pride event, um, a fundraiser, like Cole mentioned earlier, has its place. But I think also allowing for there to be spaces for people who uh, have specific interests and things. So like there's, um, there's a queer uh, homesteading community, not too far from here. Um, it's all a bunch of gay men doing homesteading and which is kind of interesting. Um, there was something else that came to mind. Oh, I wanted to talk a little bit, address a bit the seniors issue. I think that's a very important piece because both where Cole lives and where I live, there are a lot of senior citizens uh, or people approaching senior status, including my neighbors. And that's, a, that's an area that I think we need to look at in the future are our queer elders um, and uh, having some support for them too. I will shut up now because we only have one minute left. All right. So sorry, Cole. I'm just going to go to Skylar just to see if Skylar has any last thoughts before we wrap up. Um, I think everyone kind of said <laughs> what I would typically say. Um, I think it just also just depends where you're located. It really does change and the networks and connections that you make and 
You can do outreach activities, outreach engagement, and try to engage people in that way. You can do nonprofit. You can do um, civil society involvement. It depends where you would like to take it. If you want to take it in a getting politically engaged with, with other queer folks or gender diverse folks, and you want to take it to different levels, you can do things like that, like civil society um, groups or working groups. You can get engaged within working group means. Or if you're just looking to hang out and chill, you can do like Zoom arts and crafts or in cultural things like beating together or like beating Thursdays or something like that, like a call out. But I think it's really essentially like kind of what Coastal Queer already said, like just kind of asking and engaging, what do you want to see? And then taking that input and that feedback and integrating it as best as possible within the means that you have, because obviously finances and capitalism and all those other factors, and then, you know, grants and applying for grants and the strictness within that and the competitiveness can be tricky. So for folks that may not have access to that financial means. Um, it could be something as small as, yeah, as putting post posters or flyers or using social media and then seeing if there's a place you want to meet. Even like libraries, public libraries, you can rent out a room or a space there and, you know, maybe do a paint night there. These are just small little minute ways that you can get creative that are beyond the capacity of like, I need a grant to do it type of thing. <laughs> That's just some ideas back there, but I'm all about non nonprofit organizations too. So but I'm also a lot, a, a lot about political engagement. <laughs> so yeah, so if you want to get involved in civil society, working groups, and then even in the UN level for this type of different sustainable development goals, you can always get involved in that level as well if you find other people with similar interests. Well, it's all about, it. basically you're describing building community, right? Like that's what we're all sort of talking about. All right, so uh, I want to thank you, a uh, big give off for a big thank you to our presenters and of course all of our participants uh, for being here. Uh, this is our final session of the day. We're grateful that you could join us for our final day of the CBRC Summit. Uh, please remember to share your feedback on the session by completing the evaluation form. Uh, we'll be inviting you to complete a longer survey about your overall experience of this year's summit. And thank you for joining us and I hope that you have a great rest of your day and I hope you've enjoyed your summit. Thank you all. Thank you Bye. very much. Thank you for having me. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. Bye. <laughs>